Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the second uh, of our uh, weekly series of talks now uh, on astronomy uh, that are going to be going on during this period of lockdown. So while we're all at home, uh, we're going to be uh, broadcasting every week uh, fun and exciting uh, astronomy things to keep you entertained and educated. Uh, this talk is the first of a two-parter, so we're going to be talking about hunting for aliens this week and next week. Um, this week, I'm going to be talking about how to find a planet uh, that might be suitable for life. So we're going to be talking about all the ways that astronomers look for planets around other stars and how we decide if they might be nice to, uh, for life to live on. And then next week, we're going to be talking about how we learn about these planets and how we actually might go around and hunt for living things on them. Uh, just like last week, uh, this is going to be an interactive talk. Uh, you're going to have the chance to ask questions as well as participate in some quizzes. I can see some questions are already coming in at the moment, which is very nice. Uh, the same as last week, we're going to be using Slido. Uh, so there's two ways of logging on. Either you can go to slido.com on a smartphone or something and use the code ALIENS. And that would uh, get you into the lobby so you can ask questions and uh, respond to polls and stuff like that. Or alternatively, uh, there's that QR code, uh, that thing in the top left hand corner. If you just take a photo of that on your phone and that will get you into the lobby so you can participate. OK, and I'm going to go back to the presentation. And yes, yeah, so like I said, today's talk is all about finding a planet that is suitable for life. So how do astronomers go about looking for planets? Um, I always like starting talks with this uh, this picture. It really gets people in the mood, right? It reminds you what astronomy really is, which is just going and looking at lights in the night sky and then using that to try and understand things about the universe. And there's lots of different things in this picture. You can see the Milky Way, that nice stripe of light across the sky that we talked about a bit last week. And you can see a tree in the foreground. But what I want to really point out and what I want, what I want to start thinking about is the stars. So if you go into somewhere really dark, you can see loads of stars in the sky, right? And a very, very long time ago, thousands of years ago, people started to realize that there were, it looked like there were two different kinds of stars. So most of the stars in the sky stay in the same place night after night. And of course, they didn't really stay in exactly the same place because we live on a spinning planet. But the stars spin around the sky and then return to the same positions. And that's why the constellations stay roughly the same, like year after year. So you've heard of things like uh, the Plough or the Big Dipper and the constellation Orion. These stay the same shapes because most stars stay in the same place. But a really long time in the past, people also realised that there were a handful of very bright stars that seemed to wander around the sky, and these seemed very, very special. And so uh, they called them the wandering stars. And uh, it was the ancient Greeks, if you've heard of the Greeks, they're people that lived thousands of years ago, they called these the wanderers, although they didn't actually use that word, right, because that's an English word. They used the Greek word for wanderer, which is planets. So what they were doing was were discovering the planets in our solar system. Nowadays, of course, we have a very nice idea of what the solar system looks like. This is our, uh, to do a recap from last week, this is our solar system. It's a picture of the sun on the left hand side. This is the big star in the middle of our solar system. And then lots of relatively smaller planets that are orbiting around it. And this is what a solar system is, right? It's a star with a few planets uh, spinning around it. Um, I want to start off with the first uh, poll uh, now, uh, the first kind of uh, interactive question. So if I go to this and I want to uh, ask you this. So what actually is a planet? We've been talking about planets quite a lot. Uh, we've been talking about planets in our solar system. But what is a planet? Uh, this is a multiple choice one and uh, you can choose more than one option. Uh, so I just want you to take anything that you think uh, counts as a planet. Uh, so t to be a planet, do you have to be orbiting a star? Do you have to have an atmosphere? Do you have to be made of rock? Do you have to be ball shaped? Do you have to have living things on it? Uh, maybe you have to have moons. Uh, maybe you have to have no kind of junk in your orbit. Maybe you have to have water on it. These are all different things that planets, uh, you know, planets might look like. But what do you actually need to be a planet? How do we define a planet is kind of what I'm asking. So I'm just going to give you a few moments to have a think about how we might define a planet. Orbit to star is coming out <clears throat> as a quite a popular choice. 
uh, planets have to be round, atmospheres made of rock, moons. Okay, let's give you a few moments more, and then I'll uh, show you the answers, and then we'll talk about what what actually is a planet and how we decide what counts as a planet. So these are these are the answers. That there are really three rules, and this is something we talked about a bit last week. There are three rules that you have to have to be a planet. So you have to be something or orbiting a star, and you have to be kind of round, like spherical, like a ball shape. And the the other one is that you have is this fourth one down here. You have to have cleared your neighborhood, which means there has to be no kind of junk in your orbit. This is why Pluto doesn't count as a planet anymore. All the other ones, like having an atmosphere, being made of rock, having moons, these are things that planets might have, but you don't definitely need them to be called a planet. To be officially called a planet, this is what you need. You need to be orbiting a star, you need to be nice and round, and you have to have no other kind of big junk uh, things in your neighbourhood. And that third one is why Pluto doesn't count as a planet anymore. Okay, very nice. You did very well there. So let's go back to talking about planets, shall we? Uh, so these are the planets in our solar system, and we've spent a lot of time studying our solar system, and it's by learning about our solar system, it's taught us all about how stars are made and how planets are made. So you can look at our solar system, you know, what do we learn from our solar system? When we study our solar system, what does it teach us about how planets are made? I mean, there's absolutely loads of things, right? But just to pull a few out, it's quite interesting that all of the planets in our solar system orbit in what we call a plane. Uh, what that means is, if you remember from last week, where I showed you a picture of the solar system like this, the planets aren't just whizzing around the sun at random. The planets are all going around in the same kind of flat uh, way, in the same direction. And, you know, wh whatever the reason for that, that's got to be a clue for how solar systems are made. Um, there's this other thing that, again, we spoke about last week, that all of the planets that are close to the sun are these little rocky things. And then all of the planets that are far away from the sun are these big gassy things like Jupiter and Saturn. And again, that's got to be a bit of a clue to how solar systems form. And so all of our understanding, or a lot of our understanding and our theories for how planets form were, de were developed to explain our own solar system. But what about other solar systems? Um, are there planets around other stars? Because, you know, it's always a bit dangerous uh, building loads and loads of theories just looking at one single thing. And, our, our, you know, at the end of the day, we just live in one single solar system. There are millions and millions of stars out there, something like 100,000 million stars in our Milky Way alone. And if our sun is a star, it would make sense that all of these stars in the sky could have solar systems as well. So this gets us on to what I want to be talking about, which is how do we actually look for planets? Now, your first idea might be to build a very big telescope and look very, very carefully at these stars. And that sounds like a very sensible thing to do. Um, unfortunately, this is not a very good way to look for planets. Uh, the reason is the very obvious thing that stars are really, really, really big and bright. And planets, in comparison, are really, really small and really, really faint. Um, so looking for a planet around a star, you're trying to find something really small and next to something really, really big and bright. It's a bit like walking down the beach and looking at a lighthouse and then trying to use like a really high powered pair of binoculars to see a tiny little firefly buzzing around the lighthouse. It doesn't really matter how how good your binoculars are. You're never going to like look past the glare of the lighthouse to see a tiny little firefly. And so this is the problem that astronomers are trying to solve. Uh, we're trying to find this tiny little faint thing next to this big bright thing. So we have to be a bit more clever than just taking a telescope and staring really hard. And so these are two of the ways that astronomers have come up with to actually look for planets around other stars. Uh, I'm going to call them the wobble way of finding planets and the shadow way of finding planets. Uh, if you want to be really scientific, you can call them the Doppler shift method and the transit method. But for today, uh, we're going to be calling them wobbles and shadows. And luckily, they're both dead easy to understand. There's nothing really really complicated going on in how we look for planets at all. So I'll just quickly explain how they both work so you know that how real life astronomers actually go around looking for planets. So first of all, this wobble way of finding planets. 
all you have to think about for, for thinking about the wobble way of finding planets around other stars is gravity. So we spoke a bit about gravity last week, about the way the Earth is orbiting around the sun, because the sun's much bigger than the Earth, right? It weighs like a million times more than the Earth. And so because the Earth is quite light compared to the sun, the sun's gravity pulls the Earth around in this big wide orbit, and we go around once a year. But the Earth has some gravity as well, right? We're all feeling the Earth's gravity right now. The reason we're not all floating off towards the ceiling is that we're feeling the gravity of the Earth right now. And so just like the Earth goes in a big wide orbit because it's pulled around by the sun's gravity, the sun is also going to be pulled around a little bit by the Earth's gravity. But because the sun is so much bigger, it's much, much harder to move. And so the, the sun isn't going to go in a big wide orbit. So what actually happens is the Earth goes in a big wide orbit around the sun. And the sun, in its turn, just kind of wobbles backwards and forwards as it's pulled around by the gravity of the Earth. So this thing that we spoke about last week, that you know the sun sits in the middle of the solar system not moving and all of the planets just swing around it. It's not quite true. The planets do go around the sun, but in turn, the sun kind of wobbles around just a little bit as the gravity of the planets pull it around. And so even though we can't see planets around other stars, we can see stars really easily. And so if we point our telescope at other stars and we see them wobbling around, this has to be evidence that there's a planet orbiting around them that we can't see. So this is one of the ways that we find planets. We use our telescopes to look at other stars and we see the stars just wobbling around just a little bit as planets pull them around. This wobble can be quite hard to find. So the sun is pulled around by the Earth at about walking pace, about the same speed you walk, which is quite a difficult thing to measure. To measure. If you imagine having to look over you know, tens of light years, which is you know millions and millions of miles, and measure the speed of something down to an accuracy of walking pace. It's a really hard measurement to make. But nevertheless, this is what we do, and we look at stars and we see them wobbling around. This is a really famous way of finding planets because this is what we use to find the first ever planet orbiting a different star. So this is a drawing of it. It's called 51 Pegasus B. It's a very famous planet because it's the first one that we ever found orbiting a star. Um, this is so. This is a nice drawing of it. It's about the size of Saturn. It's a nice gas giant planet. And it's a really weird planet because it orbits its star in just four days. So a year on this planet is four days long. Um, to orbit in just four days, it has to be really, really close to its star because it's going around really fast. Uh, so this is a, just to show you how close that is. This is a cartoon of our solar system with the Sun and Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars to show you the rough distances. And then this is where this new planet we found around this other star is, 51 Pegasus B com uh, compared to our solar system. So it's much, much closer to its star than anything in our solar system. And Astronomers got really, really excited about this when we found it. I mean, firstly, because we've just found a planet orbiting another star. That's really, really cool and exciting in itself. But also, if you remember that thing I said at the start, that all of the planets in our solar system that are close to the star are these little rocky things, and all of the planets far away from the star are these big gassy things. The first ever planet that we find orbiting a different star is a big gassy thing that is closer to its star than anything we have in our solar system. So that rule, what we thought was a rule uh, was wrong. We had a lot more to learn about how planets in solar systems actually work. So this is a very, very exciting thing to learn. And this is a very famous planet, the first uh, planet we've ever found orbiting a different star. So that's this wobble way of finding planets, right? We just look at stars and we see them wobbling around because of the planet's gravity. The other way is looking for shadows. And so this is a video uh, taken in our own solar system. And you can probably guess what the big bright thing is, right? It's the sun. And the dark shape going across it is a planet. So this is the planet Venus, and this is what we call a transit. So from our point of view, we're seeing Venus going orbiting around the sun and just going in front of the sun. The thing I really want to point out and what I want you to notice is that you can't really see Venus itself, right? Not in the same way that is that you normally think of seeing things like the light bounces off it and goes into your eyes. All you can see is the dark shadow that is caused when Venus is blocking some of the sunlight. It's like a little mini version of an eclipse. If you think of a, uh, a solar eclipse, it's when the, the moon goes in front of the sun and blocks all the light out and it goes dark even in the daytime. 
this is like a mini version of this. So, but rather than the moon going in front, it's just Venus going in front. And so it's blocking a much, much tinier amount of the light. But even still, it is blocking some of the light. And if you could imagine taking a telescope and measuring all of the light from the sun, just as Venus goes in front, because some of the light is being blocked out, the sun would get just a little bit less bright, right? And that's what that's why we see this dark shadow. And so even if we couldn't see Venus going across the sun really nicely, if we just notice the sun get a teeny tiny bit less bright, that would tell us that there has to be a planet orbiting around it. And so this is how we look for planets around other stars in the same way. So if a star has a planet orbiting around it like this, all we have to do is measure how bright the star is. And then as the planet passes in front of the other star, the star will get just a little bit less bright just for a moment. And we can't see it as clearly, right, because they're too far away. But uh, if we, when we see stars get a little bit less bright just for a moment, this is proof that they have to have a planet orbiting around them. We built a special space telescope to do this. So this is a picture of a space telescope called Kepler. And this was launched by NASA about 10 years ago. And Kepler's whole job was to look for planets around other stars. So it just stared all around the sky at thousands and thousands and thousands of stars, just waiting and waiting for these little like winks out in brightness that shows you there has to be a planet orbiting around them. Um, I'm gonna show you a cool video now of all the planets that Kepler found. So this is, I, I absolutely love this video so much because it really gives you the idea that planets around other stars are not that rare anymore. Um, they were hard to find originally, but now we've got really, really good at finding planets around other stars. So Kepler on its own, this one space telescope, found nearly 2,000 stars, uh, 2,000 planets orbiting other stars. And in total, we know of nearly 4,000 planets in distant solar systems. Um, so this is like a little cartoon of all the planets we've found in different solar systems. They, it's color coded, so the red ones are hot lava planets, and the blue ones are uh, more like Earth temperature planets, and the, the big ones are big Jupiter things, and the little dots are small rocky type things. But it just it gives you the idea of just how many planets we've found. And some of the planets around other stars we found are really, really cool. Uh, so we found lots of planets that live around double stars. So our sun is just the only star in our solar system, but some planets are orbiting two stars. And there are lots of really, really cool, pretty pictures of what it would look like for a planet to be orbiting two stars. Uh, this is one of them. Um, I also think it's, it's actually the law that when you talk about planets orbiting two stars, you have to show this picture and talk about Star Wars, right? But I, I find this incredibly cool. So when people first thought about planets orbiting two stars, it was just a made up thing from for films. But now we know it's actually true that there are planets you could walk on where there would be two suns in the sky. Kepler also found some really, really cool things. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, one of the strangest things uh, that Kepler found. So I'm going to show you uh, just a quick graph, uh, which uh, if, if it's a bit complicated, don't worry, we're going to be getting onto what it's actually showing in a second. So this is a star called J1407, and this is the planet. This is a graph showing you the brightness of the planet as it goes in front of the star. The weird thing that I want to point out is that something is blocking all of the light from this star. So the star gets down to like 0% brightness when the planet is passing in front of it, which should be impossible because, you know, planets are much, much smaller than stars. What has to be causing this is that the planet that's orbiting this star that we found is a giant like super version of Saturn with rings 200 times bigger than Saturn's rings. So this is a drawing uh, of uh, of this giant version of Saturn. It's an incredibly cool planet. So if uh, you could take Saturn in our solar system and replace it with this planet, it would be uh, so big and so bright that our daytime sky would look like this. So this is what the sky would look like to another planet in that solar system. So that's the full moon on the left hand side. And if so it's big enough and bright enough to be seen during the day. So there are some really, really cool things out there. Some really, really weird and wonderful and fascinating planets in different solar systems. Uh, I want to talk about one more super interesting thing before we talk about how we look for planets suitable for life. So everything I've been talking about so far 
we're never really seeing the planet, right? We're using what we call indirect methods. So we're either looking for the shadow because on the star because the planet is blocking a bit of the starlight, or we're looking for the wobble of the star because of the planet's gravity. We're never really seeing the planet. What we really want to do is see the planet for real because the more we can see the planets, the more we can learn about them. So this is a really cool mission. So this is a, a mission that is hopefully launching in the future called the New Worlds Telescope. Um, it's a space telescope here on the right, and this kind of pretty sunflowerish thing you see on the left is called the Starshade. And the idea is, is that the telescope and the Starshade are gonna launch into space together at the same time and then separate until they're a really long way apart. And the Starshade is the perfect shape for blocking out light from the star. So if you remember when at the start I was saying you can't really see planets orbiting other stars because it's a bit like seeing a firefly next to the lighthouse. What this is, is a really clever way of blocking out the light from the lighthouse so we can actually see that really faint thing underneath. Um, we built, uh, so that, that's in the future, um, a small prototype version of this has been built and this uh, let people a few years ago get this video. So this is incredibly cool. I get so excited about this. Um, this is the first ever direct detection of uh, planets orbiting a different star. So what we're looking at here, this is a star system that's over a hundred light years away. And we are looking at it uh, either from above or face on, depending on how you want to see it. And uh, right in the middle is a star and we have blocked out the light from the star really carefully. And those bright blobs that you can see orbiting around it are planets. So these are actual planets in a distant solar system orbiting the star. I, I love this like so much because you, you, you can actually see planets orbiting in a distant solar system. And so this is definitely like how like the, the future of this, being able to really see these planets directly. Because the more we can actually see planets, the more we can start asking really, really big, important questions like this one. Are we alone in the universe? So this talk is called Hunting for Aliens, right? And so uh, I've talked a lot about how we actually find planets, but how might we find planets that are nice for life? Um, so this is one of the biggest questions that we can ask, right? Are we alone in the universe? And I want to do a, uh, I want to switch to a poll because I want to know what you guys think. This is uh, something that I think almost everyone thinks about at some point. And I want to switch to this one and just see what you guys think. Uh, so I'm going to make the result, re uh, results invisible so you can't see uh, what's happening as, as the numbers are coming in. So I just want, just want to know your thoughts. Uh, there's no right or wrong answer. I just want to know what you might think. So are we alone in the universe? Is there life out there? Let me know what you think. I'll give you a few moments to have a think and answer. This is an interesting question to ask. I think you get you get a sense of whether someone is <laughs> like how optimistic some people are about these big questions because this is one of the questions that no one really knows the answer, right? So it's just fun to see uh, what people's answers might be. Okay, let's see what you think. Oh, wonderful! So yes, is far far more popular. So lots and lots of people thinking that that yeah, there could well be life out there in the universe. Uh, we're alone, uh, about one in 10 people or so think that we might be alone. Lots and lots of people thinking that there has to be life out there in the universe. And even though we don't know the answer for sure, a lot of scientists I think would agree um, and think there probably is life out there because there are loads of planets, right? All of these planets I've been talking about, um, there are millions, millions and millions and millions of planets, even in our own galaxy. Uh, so the chance of there being life out there in the universe, um, yeah, I mean, no one knows for sure, but it, it seems like it could be quite likely. Okay, so how are we going to find a planet that is nice for life? Because if you remember this planet I spoke about before, 51 Pegasus B, the first ever planet we found outside of our solar system, this is probably a terrible place for life. Uh, first of all, it's a gas giant planet, so there's no real surface to walk around on. 
But also, if you remember I said it's so close to its parent star, it goes around in just four days. And so because it's so close to the star, it is scorchingly hot. And so the surface temperature on this planet is is about 2000 degrees. So it, the whole planet is like a big burning cloud in space. So probably not a very nice place for life as we know it. So what we really want is not just any planet. We want to find a planet where we think the conditions are really nice for life. So how might we describe that? How might we find a planet that's nice for life? Let's think about our own solar system. So this is the Sun on the left and Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. So if you remember from last week, we were talking about what the what it was like on all these different planets. And on Mercury and Venus, it's too close to the Sun for life, as far as we know. Uh, on The temperature on Venus is hot enough to melt some metals, right? So if you're too close to your star, it's probably too, cl like too hot for the chemistry of life to get going. But if you get too far away from your star, you have the opposite problem. The winter on Mars gets down to like less than 100, uh, minus 100 degrees. If you're too far away from your star, it could well be too cold for life to get going. So where you really want to be is this in-between region where you're not too close and you're not too far away. So you're not too hot and you're not too cold and the temperature is just right for life. And so uh, for probably obvious reasons, this gets called the Goldilocks zone because the temperature is not too hot and not too cold and it's just right for life. So this is what astronomers get really excited about. So it's uh, planets in the Goldilocks zone are ones that we think the conditions might be nice for life. And it's not just our own solar system. Every single star will have a Goldilocks zone. So if you have a star, depending on how hot the star is, depends on where the Goldilocks zone is. A very hot star will have a far away Goldilocks zone. A very st cold star will have a close in Goldilocks zone. So all we have to do is look at the star's planets and ask which of them are in, or you know, which of them, if any of them, are in the Goldilocks zone. And if we find a star with planets with one in the Goldilocks zone, then everyone gets very happy and excited because we've found a planet that the conditions might be nice for life. But how many of these things are there? How common are they? Well, unfortunately, they're quite difficult to find. So I showed you this, uh, this picture before, and remember I spoke about how there are around 4,000 planets in different solar systems that we've found so far. Unfortunately, most of those 4,000 planets are not nice places for life. Most of them are way too big or uh, way too hot. And that doesn't necessarily mean they're more common and that nice planets that are nice to live on are rare. It just means they're hard to find because big planets very, very close to the star are very, very easy to find. But kind of smaller planets that are a bit further away, like the Earth, are at the moment quite difficult to find. So we don't know about as many of them. So we have to, we have to cut the numbers down quite a lot, unfortunately. So we go down from about 4,000 planets uh, that we know in total to about 21, roughly. So these are the 21 uh, planets which are similar to Earth that we think might the conditions might be nice for life. So even so they're ordered so you can see the name of these 21 planets so on the right hand side just for comparison we've got some planets in the solar system but and then the list, list of planets is on the left hand side. Um, I always find it quite exciting. If you look at the, the planets that's in the top left, that's Proxima Centauri b. That is the most habitable exoplanet we've ever found. And it's also orbiting the star that's closest to us. So even though right now we probably wouldn't have any way to reach it, uh, but in the future, if we invent better ways of traveling through space, I think that's going to be a very nice target uh, to go and explore. So 21 planets so far that we found where the conditions are nice for life. Um, all of these things have been found in the last few years because they're very, very hard to find. If I was doing this talk just a few years ago, I'd have to get to the end now and say, you know, we've never found any. Hopefully we will do one days. Uh, but with our new technology, our really, really big telescopes, we've found all these planets and we're going to be finding more in the future. Uh, so this is a, a, a future space telescope called Plato that's going to be launching in a few years time. And this is a replacement for the Kepler space telescope that I spoke about a while ago. So one of Plato's main jobs is going to be looking for Earth-like planets around other stars where the conditions are nice for life. So even though we've only just been able to find these planets, planets where the conditions are nice for life, we're going to be finding loads more in the future and then we can really start studying them and looking for signs of life. 
So I think this is probably quite a good place to finish. Um, so this week's, like I said, was the first part and two part talk. So today was all about how we find planets where the conditions are nice for life. Next week is going to be all about how we actually study these planets and how we look for signs of life in the atmospheres uh, of these planets. Now, I think now uh, we, there's going to be some time to answer questions. So I'm going to go over to your Slido questions, if I can get this to work, and have a look. Oh, uh, some lovely questions. Are aliens... Okay, I'll, I'll go from the top down. Are aliens like us, uh, says Anonymous, first of all. Um, this is one of the questions that I don't think anyone knows the answer to. Um, so traditionally, people would draw pictures of aliens and make them look a bit like people, right? So like, you know, a big, big head and two eyes and walking around. Um, so while I, I will say no one knows for sure, I would be surprised if aliens look like us. Because even if you look at all the life forms on Earth, right, there are so many different, like, bizarre, strange things. Look at the most clever, um, you know, the most intelligent animals on Earth. There are us and there are chimpanzees. But also octopuses are very, very intelligent and they look very, very alien, right? They kind of have lots of tentacles and they swim around in the sea. So while no one knows for sure, I wouldn't be surprised if if aliens do exist, if they look completely different than anything we could even imagine. <laughs> What's in Area 51? Um, I mean, no one knows. It's a secret side. Um, I, th I, I don't think there are aliens um in out there i think we i think we would know if aliens uh visited earth um i should say so you know while we i've been saying uh aliens potentially exist i don't believe in little green people uh, like flying around in flying saucers right i think aliens if they do exist are living on their own planets orbiting other stars um i think it's most likely that area 51 is a place for people to build uh, new airplanes i think that's the most likely thing how many aliens are out there? These are, these are all questions that are quite hard to answer. Um, it's really hard to tell. Uh, we know that um, there are something like 100,000 million stars in our galaxy and probably roughly around the same number of planets, right? So maybe 100,000 million planets in, and that's just in our galaxy. We know that the ingredients for life are everywhere. Things like water, uh, things like carbon, uh, all, all this, the building blocks of life are everywhere and planets are everywhere. So that might make you think that there are aliens absolutely everywhere. But then this makes you ask a very, very big question, which is why does it look so much like we're alone? So this is something called the Fermi paradox, which we're going to be talking about a bit next week. Um, it's very easy to convince yourself that aliens should be everywhere, but it looks a lot like we're alone in the universe. Uh, so how many aliens are out there? Um, I have no idea. Do black holes die? This is a great question. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the person that worked this out uh, was uh, called Stephen Hawking. He was a very famous astrophysicist here in Cambridge. Um, he uh, discovered this thing called Hawking radiation. So over time, black holes do lose energy and kind of they eventually die. But it takes a really, 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 really long time. So for a normal sized black hole, it would take far, 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 far longer than the total age of the universe to die. So black holes uh, do die, but it takes a longer time than anyone could even imagine. The age of the universe right now is going to be a tiny dot compared to the age of the universe when black holes start dying. Uh, how many planets that we know could have life? Um, so I think this a lot depends on how you define life, right? Uh, so um, what we are, what we're always looking for is life as we know it, right? Um, and life as we know it needs conditions that we, you know, similar to life on Earth. And so that that's that list of twenty one planets that I showed you before. Um, there always is always the possibility that life could be far, far weirder and more strange than we could imagine. And if that's true, then the answer has to be, I don't know. Uh, but sticking to life as we know it, um, so far, we think kind of a reasonable guess is about 20 that we've found so far. Um, that's, you know, th those are only ones in our cosmic backyard. And there are definitely hundreds of thousands of millions of them all the way through the universe. Uh, what's space made of? This is a difficult question to answer a bit. So um, according to Einstein, a very famous scientist about 100 years ago, um, space is made of, uh, you can think of space and time as the same kind of thing made of this thing called space time. And it's this kind of like the stretchy fabric of the universe. Um, so it's a li little bit hard to answer, but you can think of space and time like as being like what the universe um, is made of. Uh, 
Um, would aliens speak the same language as as or a different language or none? Um, I think it's I think it's fair to say that if aliens are out there and they do talk, they would definitely speak a different language. Because um, even people, uh, people on Earth, we all speak loads and loads of different languages. Um, you know, if you go across to France, people in France speak different languages to us, right? Here in England, and so I think it's, I think it's almost, I think it's very, very fair to say that if aliens do exist and if they do speak, then they will definitely use a completely different language. Can a planet ever be bigger than the star, meaning the star orbits around the planet instead of the planet orbiting a star? Uh, very good question. The answer is no, for a very interesting reason. So the reason a star is a star is because it shines with its own light, right? It means there's nuclear fusion, this special nuclear reaction going on in the middle of the star that's producing heat and light. What makes uh, that heat and light um, is uh, so the reason for that heat and light, the reason for that nuclear reaction is just the really, really, really high pressure in the middle of the star. And that high pressure is just because of how big the star is. So uh, the re what I'm getting around to saying is that if you could make a planet bigger and bigger and bigger, eventually the pressure would be so big it would turn into a star. Uh, so the sun is made of hydrogen. Jupiter is also made of hydrogen, right? So Jupiter is made of mostly the same stuff that the sun is made of. But the reason we call Jupiter a planet and not a star is because it's too small to start this burning process. So you can never have a planet bigger than a star because if you make, get a planet big enough, eventually it would turn into a star. How long does it take for the Earth to form? So the Earth formed about four and a half thousand million years ago, along with the rest of the solar system. Uh, so starting from zero and ending up now uh, has taken about four and a half thousand million years. Uh, but actually, to to get uh, from you know to get from nothing to uh, something that looked roughly like the Earth, maybe a hundred million years is a reasonable guess. To get for, to start from a kind of cloud of gas with little kind of grains of dust in it, and then gravity sticks it all together and it gets bigger and bigger, and eventually you end up with planets. Maybe a hundred million years is a rough is a good guess. A very very long time. Aaron, age 10, says, can you get sucked into a black hole? Uh, so the answer is yes. I mean, anything could get sucked into a black hole if it goes close enough. So black holes aren't like uh, big kind of cosmic hoovers, like big cosmic vacuum cleaners going around sucking things up. Black holes are just things that have gravity like anything else. And um, if you get too close to them, then you fall into a black hole. Um, the interesting thing is that things that fall into a black hole, before they fall in, they get stretched out really, really long and thin. And I promise the real scientific word for this is spaghettification, because you get pulled out really, really long and thin, uh, like a piece of spaghetti. Uh, let me see. Oh, there's so many questions coming in. I'll answer just a couple, I'll answer just a couple more before we finish. Um, how uh, could aliens be in forms like water? Um, I mean, we just don't know, right? We just, we really just don't know uh, enough about aliens. Uh, we, first of all, we don't even know if aliens exist full stop. Uh, we are trying very hard, and like I was saying uh, during the talk, over the next five or 10 years, we're gonna be building better and better telescopes to look for signs of life. Uh, we really can't say right now. Uh, we have to, uh, yeah, we have to, we have to learn more before we can say anything sensible. Would scientists try and make contact if they found life? Uh, said Chloe. Um, th this is a good question. I think the answer is yes. So we have always we have already tried to make contact uh, with uh, things in outer space. So we uh, sent a uh, sent spaceships called Pioneer and Voyager out uh, decades ago to take photos of the planets in the solar system, and they were equipped with messages for outer space. Uh, so Voyager c c had on it a golden record, a way of kind of playing sounds that contained uh, the word hello and greetings in 55 different languages from around the Earth and uh, some nice sound recordings. And that was meant to be our message to the universe. So in a way, we've already tried to make contact if we found life. Um, but I think if we found life on another planet now, um, I think there would be a lot of people that would talk about whether we should or not. But I, th I, I bet we would end up trying to do it, definitely. What are stars made of, says Maya? Um, stars are made of gas, and the gas stars are made of is called hydrogen. Uh, so they're basically big burning balls of gas in space. 
Uh, Oscar and Harrison said, who made the idea of aliens in the first place? This is a really good idea. Uh, That's a really good question, sorry. Uh, The idea of aliens in the first place um, is a really, really, really old idea. People have been talking about um, things on other worlds for thousands of years. Uh, There's an ancient Greek philosopher philosopher called Democritus uh, who uh, talked about other worlds with other things potentially living on it. And that was like about 2000 years ago. Uh, So people have been thinking about these questions for a really, really long time. Okay, we're about 40 minutes in. I think this is probably a good time to finish. Thank you so much for listening and thank you so much uh, for for asking questions. Um, I hope you enjoyed the first part of this uh, talk, talking all about hunting for aliens. Uh, Next week, uh, we're going to be going deeper into it, uh, talking about how we look for these planets, uh, how we study these planets and what we might call a sign of a life on these things. Uh, So thank you very much for listening and I will see you next week.